All right. Okay, here's a little more of a meaty proposal. Um, this was for a, actually, uh, dang it, this is a different pro, a different, uh, this is a different grant program, but it's small still, but potentially just a, a little bit larger. But the, I mean, obviously, as you'd expect, uh, how the scope of and how big a proposal actually ends up being is going to be related to, <laughs> is going to be related to the scope of the project, you know, how length, how long in time, how much how many different things are involved with it, how many people, et cetera. But, um, but it's not, um, I would say it's not a direct correlation. In other words, you know, um, this proposal I'm going to show you here, it's a total of five pages. Actually, and that's minus a title page, but that is, um, that is in reaction specifically to the, the RFP, the request for proposal. They have specific, specific format to follow or forms to fill in. And so this, this proposal, sh oh, I am showing you right now, actually, right? Did I just scroll? Am I moving a document in your view now? Okay. Somehow I lost my the colored band around that, which just tells me. So this is only uh, not even five pages long, and it's that's either double spaced or spaced and a half. I mean, that's um pretty uh, pretty wide spacing. So um, some large proposals, the actual text, you know, much larger than this thousand bucks or so um, for tens of thousands of dollars really won't necessarily be a lot longer um, probably more you know obviously more detail in a budget but uh, in terms of justification and fleshing out a work plan it's not a like I said it's not a direct relationship you're not gonna be writing a, a 20 page proposal just because it's a relatively large project right um, the amount of materials submitted might end up being 20 total pages but that's not gonna be 20 pages of text okay so um, this, this proposal, this is actually, um, you can read that text, right? It's big enough. Okay. So this proposal is actually what I put together and submitted, I think back in, uh, 2011 to our in-house that's within the colleges. Uh, it's called the 21st century, 21st century fund for innovation, something like that. 20, everybody just calls it 21st century fund. And so <coughs> I think it's, um, it is a uh, fund, and I don't even remember the names of the people who contributed to it, and it is uh, intended to fund substantial projects or initiating programs that money doesn't exist elsewhere in the regular operating budget to make that happen, okay? So in this case, this example here, and most many of you have seen this, I think, um, at least some of you have the, uh, the setup we have for raising uh, brook trout each year that we've done since the starting the fall of 2011 um you know that is we go down to that budget quick yeah about twelve hundred dollars at the outset so that's a big chunk of change that's not something that is um you know typically just going to be absorbed and, and as part of a as, as part of a an s e budget line the biggest chunk of this this tic <laughs> by the time you get down to this the reader would know that means trout in the classroom a kit they the overall program, they um, have a, a collaborative, a collaboration with a, a particular supplier called That Fish Place. They use, or it's either That that Fish Place slash That Pet Place or vice versa. It's a company that sells this kind of stuff and they have put together packages for this kind of um, work. And um, so you get everything you need except for the aquarium and the insulation to put around it. Or about at that point, about a thousand dollars would be a bit more now because nothing's gotten cheaper in the last seven years. But um, anyway, so twelve hundred bucks. There's no in this case there was there is no um, well, I don't even remember if I mentioned um, where the labor would come from, but that's it's either could have been specified as in kind or with this kind of program, everybody knows you're going to put in a bunch of sweat equity for any kind of project that goes into this because this is like I said, this is an in-house program, and I think there's up to up to four thousand dollars available each year, and they usually try to spread that out over somewhere around four or five different programs. So it's enough to get something like this going. Um, getting twelve hundred bucks was higher than average, um, but uh, so you to purchase the stuff needed to get something going, and then that that project that program can be sustained by a regular operating budget. So that's the case with what we've 
got going on now. I mean, the aquarium, that's going to last until we drop it, right? Uh, the foam insulation, that'll same thing there. A lot of the stuff is very, very durable. Uh, the only thing we've had to replace, but unfortunately, this is kind of expensive is the chiller. But that's under, you know, that's going to happen. It's a lot of moving parts. It does a lot of work. It's going to wear out and have to be replaced. But, um, okay, so anyway, this, this, this program, um, most grant programs get are on an annual cycle, so they come around once a year. That's typical. There are exceptions, but this one, this this gets announced in the, like the mid spring semester deadline for the proposals, sometime in April, and then the committee that reviews those um, usually does so fairly quickly, and they're able to because it doesn't. We're not talking about dozens and dozens of proposals. We're talking like probably less than ten, and so they're going to fund anywhere from one to four, maybe five, depending on, depending on what the proposals are, how much their money they're asking for. So anyway, the, uh, they have this label as a proposal narrative is basically the body of the proposal, uh, general statement of need and purpose, right? So right up front, what, you know, what's our objective? What are we trying to, um, kind of gap are we trying to fill in here? So this is, um, like anything we write, if I go back and read, read this, I won't, how long ago was that? Well, only nine years ago. Um, I'm sure I would see things that would be like, you know, like, oh, I can't believe I wrote that or why didn't I write it a different way? But um, basically trying to explain to an audience that really would have no reason to understand anything we're trying to do um, from ground zero. And so if you skim through that, you can see we, I uh, tried to you know talk about, put this in the context of um, hopefully our students learning something from this. Um, kind of a, a refresher, I suppose, for the reader, you know, what does it really require to raise fish? And so, you know, from, from an egg, from eggs up through in the various stages, and then what are we going to do with those, right? And um, so, I mean, right here, for example, is, a, you know, one sentence that gets right to the heart of what we're trying to do and put up front the most expensive thing there, the most unusual thing. Right, because if I just wrote, oh, I want to get an aquarium, like if I was reviewing that, I'd be thinking, okay, why don't you just cruise the yard sales? Everybody's getting rid of aquariums because lots of people buy goldfish for the kids and they want to get rid of the stuff. But this is uh, the aquarium is a part of it, but a small part. Um, if you can incorporate <clears throat> images, don't go overboard, and people will see right through that as a if they're even close to using it as a substitute for substance. But in this case, trying to illustrate what it means to, you know, what a, what a fish eggs look like. Lots of people don't even, aren't biologists, right? So they don't know what, you know, what that really means. And then um, can't beat a, a pretty fish picture to illustrate what you're trying to, to get out there. Um, <clears throat> put some background information here about, this is kind of um, falls in the uh, kind of under, uh, explain, explain the, uh, your, your record or your expertise. I don't really have, exp I did not have any expertise in this other than raising some fish and, you know, and being a, a biology professor, but no specialized experience in raising cold water fish. But, um, the, the guy or our guidelines are, are what stuff we were relying on to help guide us in this. And by us, I mean me and students, right? Um, by a long established program. So I'm basically, this is kind of the equivalent of citing methodology that's already in place. It, it is actually citing methodology that's already in place. Um, so, you know, I'm using it protocols. What's a, what's a protocol? It's a protocol. Taylor, what's a protocol? Um, I mean, I know what it is, but I don't really know how to explain it. Come on, Taylor, use your words. What? Okay, let me ask you this, Taylor. This is an even tougher question. Why do we establish protocols and follow them? Oh, Monday morning, <laughs> I can't think. All right, somebody else, come on. What's the protocol? Besides Kylan, he can't wait. It's All right, like go ahead, Kylan. What's a, what's a protocol? I don't know, so I'm gonna go ahead, it's fine. A set of guidelines to follow, I guess, 
that that helps you achieve the uh, the overall goal. Okay. And yep. Uh, yeah, that's good. Um, set of guidelines we follow. Uh, very uh, typically a very rigid step by step process, right? So it's a it is a series of steps we take to get a job done, and it's based on lots of past experience, right? Generally by lots of different people, and as a as a discipline, we settle in on a protocol that works, right? So we basically solved all the potential pitfalls and account for them, or maybe even as part of the program protocol, a way to address problems if we find them. Um, so give me an example, like, you know, um, if I throw you to like some chemistry stuff, or the, the protocol for analyzing water quality would be to calibrate your instrument. And in, uh, so we do that by using reference standards, right? And um, so if something goes wrong in that process, a part of the protocol itself would be to rewind, go back to the beginning, right? Do it over in case, you know, maybe just could be as simple as just try it again in the hopes that you don't make the same mistake that you did before. Okay. So, so yeah, that's basically it. Taylor, that's what you're going to say, right? Yeah. Okay. So, and the reason we follow protocols, if they're available is because they're time, they withstood the test of time. They are, they're tried and true. Okay. So they, they work. Right. And so we use, we do that a lot, right? We use protocols a lot. Like, um, you've all used protocols from, you know, in, in a number of contexts already, even if it's within the scope of a, an undergrad science lab, you know, we're oftentimes following a recipe, a step-by-step -step process. That is an example of a, of a protocol. Okay. So if you can cite and point to existing protocols, um, that's great because that tells the reader, I mean, if they're, if they're well known and well accepted, um, the reader, if they are in the know, like they understand your, your, your project area, um, they'll recognize that and that you've done your homework, you have the expertise in this and that, that helps. All right. <coughs> okay. Um, and then, uh, you know, here's a, a figure I stole. I mean, that's the only, I gave him credit from the trout in the classroom website. And this illustrates the complexity of the system that we're trying to, uh, to build. There's not just a 10 gallon aquarium and a, you know, a little hanging uh, filter and, a, and an air pump is much more to it than that. So visual stuff is, is great. If you, if you're able to, if you have the room to put that in there. And uh, again, you don't want, can't have this be a substitute for substance. Um, but for people who are visual learners and most people are, everybody is a visual learner to some extent. Uh, being able to see this, right? This has some, um, oh, the risk of sounding corny, like an oh wow factor um, for, you know, for some that would view it, you know, because reading the words, okay, words are great, but if I can show the complexity of, of what you're trying to do and uh, whether it's photos or, <coughs> or uh, diagrams like this, that is really, can be very powerful, very helpful to use. Um, let's see. Uh, this, this program, this 21st century program, as a, a section here, data that support my views. So in other words, it doesn't have to be quantitative data for something like this, but um, quantitative is always better than qualitative if you can present it concisely. But this is where we try to explain what have we observed in, in this context, almost always, is what have we observed either in the classroom or this program is open to all employees of the college. So sometimes uh, student affairs, for example, um, they, they will apply to uh, get some money to, to get a program going for, I don't know, like uh, maybe CAB or the clubs, uh, develop leadership among students, etc. Okay, so they might, uh, this is where we specify, you know, how, what have we seen that we think points to a need to have this happen? Okay. And then, um, okay, what do you hope to accomplish? about a couple specific courses back then I was teaching a one of our uh, two intro courses SM 112 so um, that was uh, that was like the equivalent of SM 117 so that's a fair number of students coming through every year and um, who will benefit what service provided the college community um, also with this I pointed out it should be a, a point of interest for, us, ah, for prospective students and their families so you know, I always want to, you know, start with the key um, audience uh, in this context. That's a pretty easy thing to write up. It's always going to be undergrad students here. But if we can point to a secondary, maybe even 
a third level of who would benefit from it, that's so much the better. Objectives, activities, and staff. So here's where, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I didn't really have to specify. Might have, could have specified who was actually going to put this together, but um, I mean that's kind of a given. If it's a professor applying for stuff, you know who's going to be putting it together. It's going to be him, her, and or um, some students. So that could have been put in here, but either didn't think of it or probably just didn't think of it. Uh, a timeline, right? Very like standard stuff. Everybody, you're always going to have to put a, a timeline in there. <coughs> So I didn't there be able to, um, because the homework, the work is done in terms of figuring out what you need to buy. Cause you gotta, you gotta do that homework in order to figure out your budget. And so you could, okay. So you could do it half-assed and go just look up on Amazon and come up with some ballpark figures, just do a little putting stuff over into your document. But if you got any, if you're going to do is be smart about this, um, record the detail as you're going along. So even as I'm writing something like this, um, I'm gonna, I, I'll, for every project like this, I keep a notes, just literally just call it notes for, you know, whatever, notes for trout in the classroom, a Word document. And I copy and, and paste in there any bit and piece of information I think might have any use to me in the future. Because why would I not do that? And then two years down the road, um, realize, oh, where did I find that? Now I got to go do that search again. So you know, everybody's got a different system for doing stuff. We used to use actual notebooks for this, but now, you know, why not use a computer file to do that? But those files will kind of look like they're chaotic. They're messy. They're not organized. I just keep dumping stuff in there, but it's a common, uh, basically a, a file folder um, for all the different things that I've learned. And, um, and I'll, I'll put notes in there, you know, feedback, you know, such and such a vendor has better price overall than another one, right? That's stuff that I would forget within a short period of time, unless I wrote that down, but if it takes you a couple hours to, you know, do all that homework to find the best price, you know, take notes. So you don't have to go do that again. Um, so basically by the time, um, for something like this, if I get, get the, if the proposal gets accepted, pretty much got the, I'm ready to go. I can put that purchase requisition together, that form, get it, get it out there within minutes because it's pretty much all done. All right, and then um, really standard stuff here. Evaluation and monitoring methods to determine the achievement of stated, stated objectives. Um, the most, almost all grant programs um, require you to report back in some kind of a report, okay? And sometimes that can be really simple. Um, sometimes some, some foundations, I have as examples, they don't even follow up. Like they'll tell you at the beginning that they'll expect you to give a, a report after, you know, six months and then after 12 months or maybe after the first year and then at the end. Okay. Just by way of example, but sometimes some, some, uh, more common with, um, like private foundations, <coughs> like, uh, I'm trying to think, um, Oh, like the, the backpack electrofishing unit we've got, that was from a, uh, a program, through uh, what was then Time Warner Cable, which is now got absorbed by Spectrum, I think. But anyway, that was a for-profit company. They have this program in place to provide monies for uh, for education, and um, their their follow-up was really minimal. Um, I don't even know. I don't remember if I don't even think I even ever did submit a any kind of report for that. Forgetting that, but for the equipment I got from them about two years prior to that. Because, okay, so here's another thing. If you think there's any chance that you're, well, actually, I mean, you, if you think there's any chance you're going to go back to that same funding agency anytime soon, then I would say you want to be proactive in reporting back in with some results, okay? In other words, don't wait for them to hound you for it. Go ahead and put that report together, get it to them so that the next time you go to apply for some money, right? Because oftentimes it may be a very good chance there could be some of the same people there um, reviewing that stuff that, um, right, they'll um, ha hopefully have a, a positive perception of, of you and the way you do things. Um, and it doesn't take that long. I mean, this, put in a, a follow-up report to this, a few photos, a little description. I mean, the big picture, it doesn't take you very long to put together a nice little 
and, and I say little because it can be very short, um, a brief report reporting back in. Okay. Um, yeah, and I report the number of students involved, describe the activities. And, um, yeah, just and then the budget. That's that's oftentimes a it's all, almost always a totally separate section. Like there'll be a section where you end up putting together a table like this. Um, oftentimes we'll separate that into personnel and supplies and equipment, right? Those two big things. In this case, personnel that's all provided in kind. Didn't really didn't specify that in here, but that's a reflection of, of the nature of this grant proposal program, and it's all within the college. So kind of a given that's coming from a faculty member they're going to be putting they've already put work into it and they'll continue to and it's going to involve students so a lot of these kinds of proposals end up being something like what you see here and it's just it's an equipment list supplies list okay all right so there that is it's page five yeah so it's like four and a half pages and that's uh that text is I'm just talking about for a uh, senior seminar yes yeah, so this is actually double space i I believe that is dictated by the the um, the, the, the grant proposal guidelines. Um, it looks weird, like to me that that looks way too big. So what I've been telling, uh, trying to move this thing here. If you take a paragraph like this, using double spacing, that's kind of a holdover from back in the days when we only handled hard copy, right? So we needed space in between the lines to be able to write stuff in there, feedback, you know, point out typos, etc. But this is awkward reading, isn't it? I mean, it's certainly we're not used to reading stuff like this. But it continues to be sort of standard. But it, I think it's kind of holdover. But if you make it, you're writing space and a half. That's still, that's pretty comfortable reading there. Um, it doesn't really leave enough room for most of us to hand write in there. But nobody, nobody is submitting uh, grant proposals in hard copy anymore. Like that has not been a thing in a long time. Um, quite a, a number of years. So, so nobody, you know, so people might choose to write a hard copy, or I mean, print off a hard copy later if that's the way they prefer to review stuff. But um, or something like this, they're they're not be looking for typos. I mean, there's another thing. I mean, this is a no-brainer, but just to emphasize to you, if you submit a grant proposal and you get some spelling errors in there, you're not going to get any money. Um, that just reflects carelessness and laziness on your part. And uh, so if you're not, how many of you are a good speller? Matt, are you a good speller? I consider myself a good speller. Okay. How many, how many, who's a good, good speller? Cause I'm going to ask you the other, the other question. All right. So Asia, Mac, Tyler, or Tyler, oh my gosh, Taylor. That's what you get for not answering my question. Um, all right. So how many were not so good? Like spelling errors, pretty common. Yeah. Okay. So, you know who you are. So what do you got to do? What do you do, Taylor, to make up for that, to take care of that? Um, before I submit something, I do spell check. You do spell check. Okay, that's good. Kira, what else? Spell check, or I use Google Docs. So Can't hear you, Kira. Huh? I use spell check, or if I use Google Docs, it automatically changes. I heard spell check, something automatically changes. I use Google Docs, so you can have it set to automatically change. Oh, so you do? Yeah. Okay, I had to turn the volume up. For some reason, your, your audio is not coming through very loudly. Um, okay, yeah, so that's good. Do yeah, absolutely use those. Um, spell check and the, I don't even know what you call that, the checker that will, um, uh, and they've gotten a lot better. Oh, let me, here's an example. So whatever you call that, let's call it grammar check. I have no idea that's what it's called. It's gotten a lot better at detecting, for example, the difference between uh, plural and possessive. Um, used to be you couldn't rely at all on the spell checker, the grammar checker to do that really well, but that, that has gotten quite a bit better. Um, spell checkers are, you know, will catch a lot of those errors. Um, but the problem, of course, is uh, who else, who's not a, AG you raised your hand, is not so hot in the spelling department. What's I think problem? I'm pretty good at spelling. Oh, now you're going to change your... There no, you I said I was good at spelling. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe it was Mac. Uh, well, so one of the problems with the spell checkers is if you got... Uh, shoot, what do you... I'm having a, a brain fart here. 
what do you call it when, when two words are spelled differently, but they are pronounced the same? What's the name of that? <laughs> oh, smart. Ask a bunch of science kids an English question. All right. Well, you know what I mean, right? Um, two, two, and two, right? So there's an example. Um, sometimes spell checker doesn't, will, um, will say, okay, oh, we'll let those, we'll go. We'll let it go. Like won't flag it as an error, but it's the wrong, it's, it's the wrong spelling of the word, right? You need to, T-O-O -O and it's accepting T-W-O, okay? All right, <laughs> so, so that's a good step, but always get a human, right? Get a human, right? Taylor, Tara, anybody else who's not so hot in the spelling? I mean, even if you're, you wanna get feedback on your work, period, especially for something like this, right? You would be, you'd be a fool to not have someone, someone else who's, um, you know, who's going to give you, who's not going to sugarcoat it for you. You're going to put together a grant proposal, right? This is, this is, this is not you uh, submitting a course assignment. Oh, I'm just going to get this done, submit it. Okay. Give me a grade. I'm done with it. Um, this is, this will be, then this is the next step for you. You know, in a very short couple of years here, you're going to, you want, you're putting the work into that because you really, you want this to work. And you can kind of think of this as, this is like a pass fail kind of thing. You either, the pass will be, yeah, you get it funded. Boom off you go. You're going to do this project. You're going to start this program, this thing that presumably meant something to you, right? You think it's important. Um, or you fail. Now that's a little bit of a harsh word because I mean, it doesn't mean, okay, this project is no good. You're never going to get to do this. What you're going to probably do if you have the time and you're, uh, can think of some other places to potentially submit the proposal, you're going to, excuse me, you're going to take the feedback you get from the reviewers and hopefully you get some feedback if it's not funded and then take that and either you can, you can resubmit the next year, perhaps if there was some, let's suppose um, somebody points out some things that they're not really gung ho on with your, uh, your work plan. Right. So then you take a look at that, revise it, resubmit it the next, the next cycle. Um, you can take that proposal, that work, shape it into following the guidelines of another program. Okay. And so <laughs> that is very, that is much more common. That is much more common than uh, a proposal for a particular project getting funded the first time. Okay. So you got to get used to it. Trying to get money to do stuff is a humbling experience. You're going to, you're going to fail, fail a lot more than you're going to be successful. If, if it's simply defined as whether an individual proposal got funded or not. Okay. Now let me give you an example though. I submitted probably, I don't know, three, four, maybe five different versions of the proposal to get that boat um, and, and, and motor and trailer, that whole setup before <coughs> actually had success. Okay. So, you know, we could say uh, I was batting like uh, 200 because, you know, one out of five proposals actually got funded. That face value doesn't sound that great, but um, that's just part of the, that's, that is part of the, part of the deal. Um, you just, so, you know, like I said, if you got time and you can still, you know, manage the project and it continues to be of interest, you, you don't give up, you, you, you submit it to either someplace else, you tweak it and <coughs> resubmit it the same program. Also something that you got to keep in mind is that um, all, there are lots and lots and lots of really good projects, really well laid out work plans that don't get funded because there's just not enough money, right? It's always a prioritization. If you, if somebody has got five excellent proposals submitted, but they only got money to, to fund three, guess what? Two of those excellent proposals are going to get rejected, right? Um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, I got to tell you, and this is something that really is irritating. You will, we will. Um, oh, a homonym. Thank you, Mac. Just seeing the chat window there. Um, I would not have come up with that all day until I Google searched it. Um, shoot, what was I going to say? Small that. What was I just saying before I, the chat window diverted my attention like a dog and a squirrel? Two of those very good proposals will probably not be proposed. Funded. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. So feet irritated you. Yeah, irritated. <laughs> okay. So sometimes, right? So as you start 
many of you will you will do this or you'll be a part of this process whether it has anything to do with you know truly original biological research running program right all my, many organizations many employers or 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 groups that you might get involved with uh, maybe on a volunteer basis are always looking for money right always on the lookout for grant programs and people who get even get fairly decent at least at parts of this um, will always be in need okay so that's one of the reasons we're talking about this now and give you some practice with this here in the last few weeks of the semester but if your proposal gets gets rejected right and most of them will okay most of the times you will fail what you want obviously is to know okay well why why did my proposal not get funded sometimes they'll Sometimes you don't get that information at all. You just say, sorry, we had more projects, you know, more proposals submitted than we could fund, and we were only able to select, you know, X number. Well, that's okay. That's great. It makes you feel maybe a little bit better. Okay. They didn't think my proposal sucked, but it's not constructive, right? It's not helpful. And um, so you can, and I would encourage you to, if they don't give you some feedback on your particular proposal, try and get it. Get on the phone, call them up, say, I'm wondering if I can get some some feedback on this, right? And you gotta be tactful. I mean, you don't wanna um, sound like you're on the defensive, right? Call them up and say, hey, uh, Kieran and Blue, and I submitted this proposal and it got rejected. What the, you know, insert your favorite four letter word. Kiernan's gonna say, <laughs> uh, click, hang up on me, right? Um, you wanna approach that, you know, hat in hand and uh, make it clear that you're just, you're just trying to figure out, you know, where things could have been better. I mean, that's not difficult to do, right? But it does, you do got to put yourself in the right frame of mind and to remember, you know, where you are in the, in the overall situation. And when you try to get that feedback, um, I guess that is one of the potential pitfalls for making a phone call is if, uh, you know, make sure you're not, you're in the right frame of mind. Never, never call somebody up when you're angry or, or, or truly if, okay, so like Matt, you, you helped me remember, I would never call somebody up in my irritated state and say, why didn't you give me some feedback on this? You know, what the heck? I put all this time into this and you people couldn't even do me, the, have the common decency of letting me know, give me a little feedback, right? That's not going to get you anywhere. Um, so, so I would definitely do that. And I, and I, and I have done that a number of times. Um, okay. Let's see. So I'll show you here. Okay. All right, let me show you. 1046, 1046. Let me show you one more. Yeah, meaty proposal here. Okay, this one will be, let me show you, I'm gonna show you another one here. And this is gonna be, this one it says it's 11 pages. Um, so this is actually probably, this might be one of the longer ones I've ever written, not even the federal, the big federal agency grant programs, um, let you do much more than this. <coughs> so let me go to this one. This is the, come on, share screen. And I'm kind of, uh, you know, gravitating to sharing with you stuff that I know most of you are already like you're familiar with, you know what the end result is, right? So that when I'm like talking about like this frog bit project, I mean, it's the, it's the big project I got going on right now, money wise, and actually, you know, involves a couple of you already and maybe some in the future, right? Uh, Taylor, 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 Taylor. All right. Um, okay. So here is, um, I have another word document in front of you, right? Yeah, no. Okay. All right. So this is the um, proposal to what was Time Warner Cables. Again, this was now Spectrum. They had this program called Connect a Million, Connect a Million Minds program. So this was um, a lot of for-profit businesses, big corporations. Most of them, actually. Most of them have some kind of a grant program. And so part of this is PR, public relations, right? Part of it is just, I mean, but, but that's what, that's part of, that's part of life. That's part of society. That's part of being in business is advertising and 
uh, presenting yourself in a good light and leaving people with a positive feeling about your whole operation, right? So here you got this Time Warner cable, right? Cable. Nobody likes paying their cable bill. It comes every month. It's much higher than what it seems like it's probably worth to a lot of people. But we keep people people that do have cable, right? They continue to pay for it um, because it's worth it to them or it's better than the alternative, I guess. So anyway, if you're a cable company or um, we also, National Grid had a, a um, I'm sure they still have it. Um, we submitted a proposal. I don't even remember what it was for. Um, they had a, a grant proposal, or a, yeah, a proposal grant program in place, and that was a it was very much a PR kind of thing. You know what? I mean, you think about what motivation does a public utility have for putting together a, a grant program, basically setting aside money to be able to give out to community organizations for programs, right? There's no direct economic benefit to that, but advertising, you know, word of mouth and, you know, overall uh, people's attitude towards your company, that's, that is, that's huge, right? I mean, companies pay lots, spend lots of money on advertising um, and it is sort of a form of that. But anyway, so this program, they had this Connect a Million Minds program. It was really well funded. It was actually very impressive. I mean, in terms of the, the dollar amounts they put out there and the idea, not the idea, the objective of this program, I don't have the RFP to show you right now, but it was very specific. It was geared towards STEM education, right? So science, technology, engineering, math, STEM education for um, middle school, middle school students. Very specific purpose. And it was also not to be during the summer necessarily, but potentially during their like after school hours. Okay. Um, so that's what we put together. And I, in this case, it actually was a we, um, it was myself, another education elementary education's faculty member who um, she uh, she and I put this together, got this, got the money. Um, but this was after I had already submitted a, a similar proposal <coughs> to get a, a, you know, a boat motor, basically have the capacity to get out in the water and do work to at least three, maybe four other um, potential funders without success. Okay. So here we found this program that, um, it wasn't just to get the equipment, it had to be for the specific purpose. So this, a lot of this proposal actually is outlining a program um, to involve middle school students to uh, do some, some fisheries biology uh, using this equipment. But we weren't renting it, we were buying it. So it would be ours to use for the long haul, right? As long as we can maintain it and, um, you know, simple John boat like we have, there's no moving parts. I mean, that thing's going to last probably until I die. Maybe not, but <coughs> motors, boat motors, you take care of them. Typically they'll, um, many, many years of, of service without a whole lot, with very little expense. And, um, so and boat trailer, boat trailer, it doesn't get much use, grease the bearings every now and then. And, uh, that's about all you got to do. Keep it clean. And, um, it's going to last a really long time. So, proposed um, to do a you know hands-on after-school science program right up front we pretty much mimicked this is like your cover letter you know how you get a cover letter for a position you um, typically the typical advice is to write in that first sentence or two let the reader know exactly what you're applying for right and throw in a word like I'm excited or I'm enthusiastic or something like that right <clears throat> um, so that's what we did here outlining a you know five-week program early fall, late spring, each of two academic years, um, blah, blah, blah. All right. Um, we'll complement an existing program. We already did a, uh, oh, here's where some track record, um, some of your, your, your experience, your expertise can be really helpful. We had already done a, uh, a program for elementary school kids in the summer for a number of years and um, really low tech, not much equipment. Obviously, you know, working with elementary school kids, you're going to do you're restricted a little bit from a safety standpoint. You can't do as many different things you can with middle school as you can with college students, right? Um, but we had some, we had success we could point to there in terms of numbers involved, et cetera. Um, right in this abstract, uh, right here's the meat of what we want. $23,000 to get this stuff and support personnel. And then here's matching. Okay, so here's Overall, I think about like how this abstract is written. Here's the overall scope, big objective, big scale objectives, then some details about what we're going to do towards the tail end. Here's what we need to do this. 
And then the very last thing here, how are we going to match this? Okay. So the collagen matches annual cost of operating, maintaining, storing, blah, blah, blah. All right. So I cleared all that and, you know, I cleared all that with uh, checking in with um, uh, whoever was our division chair then, or maybe it was the dean. I don't know. To make sure it'd be okay. Because, you know, to how many, if you have a boat, you got to register it, right? There's a cost there. Um, you got to insure it. Okay. There's a cost there. And um, so there are costs, just like when you buy a car, it's not as simple as, oh, here's the keys. Here you go, Paige. Here's your car. Won't cost you a thing. Just put some gas in it every now and right. You got to insure it. You got to maintain it. It's going to need repairs. You know, it's going to go, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure that you, um, you have, you have got that approved. If it's, if it's of significance, like if you're talking about just, you know, like it was, if it was nothing more than the gas money, we're talking about a few tens of dollars every year because outboard motors are really good on gas, but all right. <clears throat> um, project goal and specific objectives. You know, the difference between a, a goal and an objective a lot of times those, those two terms get mixed together and we can use them interchangeably in a lot of cases, but the goal is big, big overarching thing, right? Objectives, one or more specific things within, and oftentimes they are sort of almost step by step. Okay. And, um, so our, uh, here we go. For example, right here, uh, oops, students engage in hypothesis research, strengthen their skills and use the scientific method, blah, blah, blah. That's more like the goal, right? That's the big picture. And then specific objectives down here, listing a bunch of, you know, bullet points, right? Probably more than, it looks to me right, right now, looking back at this, however many years later, that looks like a lot of bullet points, a lot of probably seven different objectives there that probably could have been tightened, but <clears throat> all right. The activities, you know, laying out the work plan. This is kind of lengthy. Um, part of it is kind of fairly detailed and written for um, a, a um, written for an audience that I could assume no knowledge. Like this was not going to be reviewed by people who had any idea what a trap net was, or you know, why in the world, what, why, you know, why do we care about going out and sampling fish, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, Logistics and timing, you're not, well, the timing is gonna be important for your proposal, but logistics, so here's something you're not, I'm not gonna burden you with thinking about, but um, so that you do understand, if you're gonna hire somebody, you're gonna hire people, there are people in, uh, in the human resources area, um, usually labeled exactly that office, that department, they're gonna have work to do. So you need to make sure that, that they are aware of what you're doing and, and they are gonna be able, they're either gonna be able to absorb that extra effort or ideally, if you could pay them for it, okay? I'm fortunate here at this college, probably most colleges, I mean, our, our mission is undergraduate education, right? It's, it's to get your careers going. Um, when we get the opportunity to, to get a, a valuable project going that's gonna get students experience, um, it's just like, just the, the mentality, the attitude here is just, okay, we're gonna make this happen. Like, we just gotta figure out how, it's not, oh, you're going to add a little bit more work to me. I mean, there's obviously a limit to that, but basically I hear this first sentence. I, I, you know, I'm not going to take care of registration fees. I can't do that. I'm not in the business office. So that's actually handled through uh, what was then called our office of extended learning. Okay. But reviewers going to want to make sure that you've done that homework and you're going to be able to make things happen and you haven't forgotten about some key things. So here again, Anytime you're going to hire somebody, there's a lot more to it. You don't get to just hand them a check or the cash. Right. Um, the timing here, who's over that? This was basically outlining um, to show the readers that we had a viable plan for working with middle school students, right? So they got to go to school, et cetera. Got to account for that. Um, talked in here about, you know, why would be, we be in a good position to do this program? And this pertains important because you're talking about putting a boat in the water and working with people. You're not going to do this. I mean, what chance of success do you have if you're going to have to drive an hour to get to the nearest lake? And, um, you know, obviously we wouldn't even have been thinking about this if it wasn't a, a potential reality, but throwing a couple maps there, how close we are to 
our home lake, um, a couple of the other ponds and lakes that are close by that we can do this on and have middle school kids out on the, it's just Tuscarora Lake we'll be doing this. Overview of your institution, really common stuff, usually specifically asked for. Um, in part, they want to know, you know, does what you're doing fit with the mission of your institution? Or have you gone rogue? Are you trying to propose something that seems like kind of sketchy? Like, will this, does this actually fit with the mission of your institution? Um, or does it seem like this might be something that you've kind of gone off the rails on and maybe haven't really talked to your supervisors about whether it's relevant or not? Okay. All right, um, let me skip down through here. Some, ex, you know, talking about your expertise, relaying, what have you done that puts you in a good position to be able to offer this? So, you know, throw in some photos here. You can't beat, you can't beat people out there in the field doing stuff. And school kids, some of our students. All right, then equipment needs. A paragraph or yes, full paragraphs about the boat and motor. I mean, the, the biggest, most expensive thing there. Explaining that and also within this, so, so this is all about the boat and the motor, etc. And here again, this was this was after several unsuccessful proposal submissions. So we had, had homed in on a very uh, on a particular model, knew exactly what we wanted to get. Um, then other parts here, the rest of this is talking about, we already have in hand. So stuff that you can already, you can offer like, so again, this is called in kind support or match. What do we already have at hand? So the first paragraph talking about a trap net. And I guess this must've been, I guess once we got the boat, I got the CAS Lake Association to fund a proposal for the second trap net <coughs> because we got two of them for two of them for a long time um but we had one that one was purchased by the college and one was from the lake association actually i think maybe the lake association got us the first one and then i was able to um get the college to put up the money for a second one but that is you know that was in part because we could show some success in other words you know, this, this works as a valuable tool, okay, et cetera. All right, and then um, personnel needs. The other big part of a lot of projects is, you know, how are you going to pay for this? How are you, who's going to do what? So we've got an outline of, you know, kind of the current rates, what we'd like to pay. Um, here's something where, uh, uh, all right. Oh. Remember last time, or maybe it was Wednesday, talking about what are you going to pay people, right? And I said, if you can, don't pay people minimum wage because you're going to get, to be blunt, you may get minimum wage quality help, and that is not what you want. Um, now, back when we put this together, we had a rate, so it must have been, it was, it was right, or I can't, it was probably not much above minimum, but it was instructional assistance for these kinds of programs. The standard... Uh, uh, framework already in place they get paid ten dollars an hour so these are typically undergraduates that would help us as like a teaching assistant for a summer program right think like a master student but you actually got paid in actual dollars right and so it was ten an hour that was it I couldn't do anything about it but in order to compensate at a higher real to compensate realistically at a higher rate um, the second sentence here we propose that assistance non-contact preparation time Contact hours in education, that means like right now, this is contact time. We're actually together as a group, okay? But before and after that, right, there's lots of other stuff that needs to happen, right? Um, that's what prep time is, right? And it's non-contact time, but typically with the summer stuff, the students that would help with these kinds of programs wouldn't get paid for anything other than the contact time. But a number of you know, the rest of you could probably guess there's a lot of time that goes into getting this equipment set up right before and after you actually take people out and use it okay so that's budgeted for that to be able to get good help and also to be fair to them right so that you know 
a lot of this stuff is is uh, you know you're typically you're not feeling like you're getting compensated as a, as a like a normal market rate anyway. But you do it because you love it in some cases. All right, and then here's the here's how that budget um, shaped up in terms of outlining the big stuff first, breaking that down a little bit into the various components, and um, this is. I mean, one of the reasons you do this is to show that you've done your show that you've done your homework. Also, a lot of people like this is a non-specialist audience. A lot of people aren't going to be familiar with the real costs of what you're trying to do. So you got to break it apart. If I did, if I just put boat and accessories and had fifteen thousand dollars on there, anybody who's cruised around on the you know, Craigslist or the internet or whatever could think, well. Why do you need 15,000 bucks? You know, here you can get this for, you know, less than a thousand bucks. So i got to lay that out, explain that. Okay. Um, we actually, yeah, now I'm looking at this. This was, this is how long ago this has been. We actually proposed to get two setups. So it's not, uh, we didn't get this much money, but, um, and then we had laid out the um, additional trap nets. At that point, you could get one for two thousand. Can't do that anymore. They're more like four. And um, and then the personnel costs really broken out there. So there's a much more a much longer proposal. This one is yeah, it's page eleven of eleven. And um, but this would be this would be this would be at the upper end, the upper end in terms of overall length of something that you'd put together. Okay. All right, so there's two different um, ends of the spectrum proposal writing. All right, and then uh, so we'll pick up on Wednesday. We'll, actually, we'll start with Wednesday. We'll start talking about what ideas um, everybody's got about what to um, maybe tackle.